Welcome back. So for this unit, we're moving from words and word classes and pieces of meaning into syntax, which is going to start covering how we're putting all of those different words together into larger units. So we've talked about how in some languages they put pieces of meaning, different morphemes together to create what looks like one word, but contains the information that we would need an entire sentence for. And so we're going to focus on the syntax of English throughout this unit. Um, and look at the sort of rules and the reasons why we are so reliant on syntax in English um, as a result of not having that kind of morphology that some of those other languages have. So to start, we'll review the word classes we have in English. These are going to be very important as we start looking at different aspects of uh, syntax and putting things together into units because we're going to be labeling all the different parts of our syntax trees and all of the different parts of the um, sentences that we're looking at based on what these word classes are. So we have our open word classes with such as nouns, pronouns that are used to replace an entire noun phrase, our different kinds of verbs. So we would mark just a verb for any of those intransitive, transitive, ditransitive verbs, and our copula verbs since they are still the main verb of the sentence. And then auxiliary verbs get their own label of AUX, ox, um, because they're doing something a little bit different than the actual main verb in a sentence. And then we have our adjectives and adverbs. And then for our closed classes, we have determiners. So the label DET, or just a D, um, for determiner is something that we use for anything like articles, demonstratives, possessives, quantifiers. So this is something that is useful to cover all of those things as determiners. So we don't label things as articles or as demonstratives. We label them all as determiners, and we'll see that when we look at where those can go in a sentence, we can only have one of them in the places that they can go. So even though we have different kinds of determiners, they're filling that determiner place, and so that's why we label them that way. And then we have prepositions, usually just with the letter P, conjunctions, which you'll, you might see a C-O-N or a C-O-N-J, and then interjections as well. So when we think about syntax, syntax is the study of word order and how we're putting those words together into larger units. So similar to how when we were looking at phonology rules, syntax rules are also language specific. And so we'll focus on the rules for English sentences and just the basic rules of uh, active voice English sentences. We're not going to be looking at a lot of crazy, intense um, sentences in this class. Um, but if you do go on to further studies of syntax, you will see more um, variation in that. Syntax can cover things like basic word order. So English, for instance, is a subject verb object language where we have our subject and then we have our verb and then our object has to go after that. And if we move those around, then they end up being different meanings. We have a different meaning, a different interpretation because we rely so heavily on that order. But other languages have a different default order for their words. So in Basque, for instance, they would have the subject and then the object and then the verb. So the sentence Pat hit Alex would look like Pat Alex hit. Um, so Patek Alex Eguro, Egurtu. Sorry, I'm terrible at Basque. Welsh, for instance, has verbs at the beginning and then a subject and then an object. And so you would have the, the sentence look like hit Pat Alex as opposed to our English Pat hit Alex. Um, so the ordering can change from language to language. And then even within these different pieces, how we put those words together is different from one language to another as well. So in English, in a noun phrase, we have a determiner, and then we can have adjectives, and then we can have a noun. So we would end up with a phrase like the large house. But in Spanish, the noun would go in between a determiner and adjective. So determiners would still come first, but then adjectives come after a noun. So you would have la casa grande. Um, and then in Indonesian, the nouns come first, and then you have adjectives, and then you have the determiner at the end. So if I'm saying the large house in Indonesian, it would be house, and then large, and then that. So these are just the basics of the kinds of things we see within syntax and how those rules are going to be different from language to language. And one of the reasons that this can happen and one of the things that we'll look at a lot as we're diving into how these things get put together is that idea we talked about at the beginning of the semester of recursion. So this is a very important property of language and this allows us to theoretically use an endlessly and creatively um, uh, increasing amount of words and phrases. So we could theoretically keep adding more and more phrases, more and more words, more and more phrases to a sentence to infinity if we really desired to do that. We wouldn't 
practically do that, but it's the idea that we can embed these other phrases or clauses or constituents um, inside some other phrase or some other clause or some other constituent. And so our rules allow for this kind of creativity, this kind of embedding, this kind of addition to um, something to add more and more information into one single larger unit. So an example would be the professor liked the book about the boy at the school of wizardry, where we have all of these different levels that are embedded inside this sentence. So we have a noun phrase that's inside a prepositional phrase. That prepositional phrase is part of that noun phrase that's larger, which is part of a larger prepositional phrase, and so on and so on and so on. So when we're thinking about recursion, this is something that allows us a lot of creativity, but there are still limits to what can go inside certain kinds of constituents. So each embedded level is its own constituent, and then it would be inside a larger constituent. So if I have the phrase, the cat who wore a hat, together this is one big noun phrase, but in that noun phrase I have the and cat, and then I have a dependent clause that's embedded inside there as well. Or from the first day of class, our example, the frog on a log in the pond by the house on the corner of my street in the town where I grew up. We again have our beginning part, we have our determiner, we have our noun, and then we have a series of different prepositional phrases that are all embedded inside, linking to additional information about the frog and about where this is happening, um, and then we also have another embedded clause. And so we can use this to see the different kinds of constituents that can go inside, the different kinds of um, embedding that can happen within something that is itself also a piece of meaning. But the limits that we have for this um, are going to be dependent on what kind of constituent. And we'll be spending time today looking at what those limits are, what are those kinds of things that can go into these different constituents. And one way to think about recursion is to think about when you're taking, for instance, this graph of a triangle that has many other triangles inside of it. Each of those is its own triangle. So even the small triangles that are individually placed inside there are their own triangle themselves, but they work to make up slightly larger triangles. Those triangles work to make up slightly larger ones until you get to that full, very large triangle that you could think of as a kind of complete sentence with all of these additional pieces that are themselves pieces, but work to form larger and larger pieces. So as we're looking at these different kinds of constructions, as we're piecing things together, we can think about how we're putting different words together, similar to how we were putting together things into words in morphology. So we have heads and dependents in any sort of phrase, and that main part of a phrase would be the head of that phrase. You can think of it sort of like the root of a word. So a phrase is always named after whatever the head of that phrase is. You can't not have that head in a phrase. And then the other parts of the phrase would be considered dependents. You can think of them sort of like affixes. And some of them could be required and some of them could be optional. So similar to how affixes work on words, sometimes we need to add them grammatically in order for it to make sense. Sometimes we don't have to add them, but we can if we want to change the meaning or we want to add meaning to something. And so the main phrases that we'll talk about in class are the verb phrase, noun phrase, and prepositional phrases. And these will always have a head, so a verb phrase will always have a verb. A noun phrase will always have a noun. A prepositional phrase will always have a preposition. And so we'll be able to see as we're looking through these different kinds of phrases, the different kinds of combinations of words, how this ends up working together. So these are known as constituents, and I've mentioned this word a few times already. Constituents are similar to what you might think of as a complete word in morphology, where you have the head and you have dependents, and as those combine together into units, this would create a constituent. So the kinds that we'll focus on are those different phrases, so noun phrases, prepositional phrases, verb phrases, and then also full clauses. So if we look at an example sentence, all students eat dinner in the Great Hall, we can see that this has a few noun phrases. So anytime you see a noun, you know you have a noun phrase. All students, the Great Hall, we have a prepositional phrase as well, so in the Great Hall, where we have that noun phrase that's linking to the preposition. We have a verb phrase because we do have a verb in this sentence, so eat dinner in the Great Hall would be our verb phrase. And then the clause would be the complete part altogether. So the clause would be what we would consider a full sentence, and that would have the, both the subject and the predicate altogether. But it is possible, just as it is with words, to have just a root 
also have a single lexical item be a constituent as well. So in a lot of cases, you don't have to have those additional pieces, but you can add those additional pieces. So grammatically, we can have single lexical words. So Sam likes pizza, perfectly fine sentence, where the noun phrases are both just one single word. Yesterday, I did nothing but eat and sleep. So two verbs that are functioning by themselves, there's no other pieces that are there with them. And so when we're looking for those, we can also test if we have a constituent just by looking at some of the different kinds of ways that they're interacting with each other. So we can, we'll dive into the actual pieces of what's in a noun phrase, what's in a verb phrase, what's in a prepositional phrase in the next lecture. But we can test constituents without having to draw them out, without having to have all of those different pieces by just seeing what kinds of things they can do. So we, a group of words would have to pass at least one of these tests to be considered a constituent, but it doesn't have to pass all of them. Not every constituent will pass all of them. As soon as it passes one of them, you know you have a constituent. And so the three that we'll talk about are to replace a constituent with a pronoun, to move it as a unit, or if it can stand alone as an answer to a question. And it's important to remember that when you have a constituent, all of those dependent pieces have to come with it for that test. So even if something like on top seems like a perfectly fine prepositional phrase, we have this additional part that's part of that that's embedded inside of it. We have to take all of those embedded pieces as well, because if we remove that out of the sentence, then we just have of the table floating there, not attached to any structure. So you need to take those dependent pieces, those embedded pieces with when you're using these tests. So for the first test, a constituent can be replaced with a pronoun or a proverb or some other constituent. Um, so we won't really talk much about proverbs, but the pronouns are things that we see very frequently. But we can use any of these forms to replace a constituent. So I can replace a verb phrase with what we call a proverb, which is similar to a pronoun in that we're just replacing it with something that's more generic. So Pat gave Alex a kiss on the cheek. I could also say Pat did so. And so this pro form takes away that new information, that specific information, and just puts a sort of placeholder instead. And so that's a way to replace verb phrases. We can replace noun phrases with pronouns. So we do this very frequently. So Pat hugged Alex, they hugged them, where I'm replacing Pat with a pronoun, Alex with a pronoun as well. And so in doing so, we can see that it's still fitting that same place, but I'm not using the full noun itself. I'm replacing it with some sort of pronoun. I can also replace prepositional phrases with pronouns, and we do this very frequently as well. So Pat gave Alex a kiss on the cheek. Pat gave Alex a kiss there. So it, you have to take the entire phrase. I can't just say there the cheek. I have to replace the entire prepositional phrase in order for it to make sense. For the second test, you can move it as a unit to another place in the sentence. So we do this sometimes when we're creating passive sentences or if we're trying to um, highlight a piece of a sentence in a, topic, a topical way. Um, and so we can move things around in certain cases. We sometimes have to do some other things that are more complicated than we'll dive into in this class. But if we have the original sentence, the child found a puppy, I can move a puppy around and say a puppy was found by the child. I can make this passive and it still works. It still makes sense because I'm moving the entire unit as a whole. Or it was a puppy the child found. So I can move these around as a unit and I can change the sort of importance of what I'm trying to focus on. But I have to take the entire phrase. I can't just take the word puppy. I can't say it was puppy the child found a. Right? If I'm only moving puppy, then that determiner is just kind of floating there, not doing anything. Puppy found a by the child. That doesn't work either. So you need to take all of the pieces of the constituent in order for it to make sense. And so that's how you can tell that it's actually a constituent. And then the last one we'll talk about is that a constituent can stand alone. So this is typically in response to a question. So if I say, in the original sentence, the puppy played in the garden. And then I ask you, well, where did the puppy play? you would say, in the garden. So by answering that with just that phrase, you know that that's an actual constituent. It can stand alone and make sense as an answer to a question like this. What did the puppy do? The puppy played in the garden. And again, remember, we have to take those dependent pieces. So the puppy did play, 
But in order for it to make sense grammatically, we have to take those embedded pieces as well. So played in the garden would be that constituent. Or who played in the garden? The puppy. So constituents themselves are the sort of building blocks for sentences. These are the phrases. These are the ways that we're putting words together into bigger units. So in the next lecture, we'll actually start putting them together into units. We'll start looking at what can and can't go inside these particular constituents. Um, and we'll start drawing trees and modeling what that looks like as we're processing these things um, as speakers of the language. Well, if you have questions, again, email me. You can schedule an office hours appointment. You can bring questions to class, and we can address them in our practice sessions together in class.